Well, great. Thank you uh, so much for having me here. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to present in front of all of you. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Morten Bennetson, Margaret Tsutsura, and Daniel uh, Wolfenson. Uh, so I guess I don't need uh, to convince you that uh, gender pay inequality uh, is a reality uh, among many um, uh, developed economies across the, the world. Um, and, you know, as a, a response uh, to the gender pay gap, a lot of governments uh, in, in many uh, countries in the developed world have proposed pay disclosure and uh, an increase in, in transparency in regards to, to pay as, as um, kind of a response to mitigate uh, the issue. For example, in the UK, firms uh, with more than 250 uh, employees uh, must publish data on differences between median uh, and mean salaries uh, of men and women. Uh, in the US, uh, uh, the previous administration signed an executive uh, order that required larger firms uh, um, to report salary data broken down by, by gender starting in 2018. However, that uh, um, uh, rule was overturned once uh, uh, the new government was elected. Um, and, and so there is a debate uh, whether, you know, pay disclosure is actually, uh, you know, an effective thing or a good thing to implement uh, or not. Uh, obviously, governments that, uh, you know, do uh, pass these legislations uh, think that this is a right step towards more uh, equal pay. Uh, unions and, and other uh, organizations uh, promoting uh, women uh, think that uh, it is a step in the right direction, but uh, many of them think actually it might not be enough. On the other hand, firms uh, uh, typically um, will argue against it, and, and common arguments will be that it lacks practical utility. It unnecessarily um, you know, increases administrative uh, burdens for firms. Um, it violates privacy, and so on. Uh, and so in this paper, we'll actually study how improving transparency uh, through gender-based uh, wage statistics may affect wages, which is what the legislation actually intends to do. But we will also see whether there is some unintended consequence of these legislations in terms of other um, you know, uh, outcomes that affect women, such as uh, promotion of women or hiring and, and separation uh, rates from firms. And we'll also look at whether such policies may affect firm outcomes more generally, such as firm productivity and, and profits. Now, finding a causal effect uh, between transparency on wages uh, uh, and, and wages is challenging for two main reasons. Uh, first of all, we need exogenous variation in transparency at the firm level. And second, we need uh, detailed data on employment and wages. And I believe these are the two key reasons why we don't actually observe uh, a lot of evidence in the literature um, in terms of that question. And so in this paper, we are exploiting a legislation change in, in Denmark in 2006 that requires firms with more than 35 employees to, there is a trap here, so yes. to be, be careful <laughs> if you are wearing heels, with more than 35 employees uh, to report wages by gender. And we also uh, have access to detailed um, employer uh, um, employee data. Now there is uh, you know, a long literature where we contribute to. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just say that there is a literature on pay transparency and its effect on, on job satisfaction and wage structure in organizations. Um, I think that uh, uh, most of these papers derive conclusions uh, from the public sector or from field experiments, uh, and they typically do not link transparency to firm outcomes. And actually, none of these papers gender, uh, st studies gender disparities in, in particular, which is the focus of this paper. Now, what happened in Denmark? So in, in 2006, uh, there was a legislation change that required uh, firms with more than 35 employees and at least 10 men and women uh, in a six-digit uh, DISCO code, which is an occupation code, to report salary data broken uh, down by gender. So the firm uh, had to inform their em uh, employees through the, the employee representatives. However, they didn't uh, need to make this uh, data available to the general public. And non-compliance by firms uh, would mean a fine. Now, what we do is a very simple diff and diff approach uh, where we define our treated group of firms to be firms that employ more than 35 uh, employees, in particular 35 to 50 employees uh, pre-treatment. And control firms will be firms that employ um, 20 to 34 employees before the law uh, changes. 
And here we're careful to take another window around the 35 employee threshold due to the very well documented uh, employer size wage effect. We know wages, uh, sorry, firm size uh, matters for wages and other firm outcomes. Now, uh, in contrast to the description of the law I gave you, uh, here we design our empirical strategy around the 35 threshold, employee threshold, and will not take into account the criteria in the law that firm have, should have at least 10 men and women in a given disco code. And the reason we do that is because actually firms in Denmark did not typically have disco code information. Uh, we um, uh, interviewed uh, uh, the DA, which is the, the, the main employer organization in Denmark, and they confirmed that. And also they actually shared with us that 35% of, fir of firms that reported uh, gender uh, disaggregated wage statistics with them did not satisfy the second criterion, yet all of them had uh, uh, more than 35 employees. And this is uh, consistent more broadly with the description of the law. Uh, if you look at uh, EU reports or the way the ILO, the International Labor Organization, describes the law, they actually focus on the 35 employee uh, threshold. They don't mention the second criteria. So uh, our main specification is uh, a diff and diff. On the left-hand side, we'll have uh, log wages. And our coefficient uh, of interest will be delta, which is the coefficient estimate of uh, these uh, uh, interacted terms, so, so treated times post times male. So treated will be one for firms that uh, employ 35 to 50 employees, and zero for firms that employ 20 to 34 employees. Male will be one for for male uh, individuals, uh, and post will be one for years after the law. So this will be run at the firm individual year level. And so data will be capturing the differential effect of the law on wages of, of male and female individuals at treated firms as compared to controls. What is neat about uh, this specification is that uh, it allows us uh, to control for time varying individual characteristics. It allows us uh, to include uh, year fixed effects, but also interacted firm and individual fixed effects that capture uh, time invariant individual firm characteristics, but also control for the match between individuals and firms. And so we can actually see what is the effect of the law on wages after controlling for many drivers of the male wage premium that have been documented in the literature, such as ability of individuals or selection into specific occupations or industries, uh, or hours worked, as I'll show you in, in later specifications, their work experience, etc. So uh, we are using detailed uh, employee-employer uh, data from Denmark. So we observe the firm ID, the, uh, the uh, uh, demographics of, of the individuals in, in the firms, their position in the firm, their wages. Uh, and we're matching those with uh, financial data from Experian. Uh, these are mostly private firms. But what is nice in Denmark is that by law, uh, financial statements of private firms have to be audited. And so data quality is pretty high. And our sample period is 2003 to 2008. Now, um, so th this is just some summary stats uh, uh, pre-treatment from our sample. Um, uh, as an, and in the last column, we, con we compare um, observable characteristics between treated and, and, and control firms. As you can see, uh, individuals in the two groups of firms are fairly similar, except uh, treated firms uh, pay on average higher wages, which is uh, no surprise given the fact that by construction, treated firms are larger. Uh, and similarly, when you look at firm level characteristics, um, you see that treated firms are larger in terms of size, uh, you know, measured by asset sales or employees, but they're similar otherwise when you compare, you know, their employee composition, productivities, etc. Also something to keep in mind for uh, later to interpret our magnitudes. Uh, when we estimate the male wage premium pretreatment within our sample, we see that overall there is a 19 percent uh, uh, male wage premium, which is 20 percent for, uh, for our treated firms. So the first thing we do is uh, we run just a univariate test uh, where we see what is the average log wage difference three years after minus three years before the passage of the law. And we, uh, we see what happens for male, females uh, uh, in, in treated and controlled firms. As you can see, wages uh, grow for everyone, both uh, men and women in both treated and control firms. But what happens is that the uh, wages grow by less 
uh, so grow slower for men in traded firms. And this difference is statistically significant. At the same time, wages for women will uh, grow slightly more for, for women, but this, this difference actually is not significant. And what is also interesting is when you look at now the, the columns in the table, um, the male wage premium drops significantly for traded firms, but it doesn't drop for, for controls. And so we observe uh, about a two percentage points reduction in the male wage premium, which as this, uh, this test suggests is driven by slower wage growth of male employees in traded firms. Uh, we then turn to the multivariate analysis uh, using the specification I showed you earlier. In the first column, you see uh, that uh, the uh, wages of male employees grow less around the law by 1.7%. Uh, there is a positive but not significant effect on female wages. And the difference here in column three uh, suggests that there is a two percentage points reduction in the wage premium um, uh, following the law between trading and control firms. Now we run uh, a, a ton of robustness checks. Uh, so we uh, show support uh, of the parallel trans assumption in diff and diff. Uh, we run placebo analysis uh, uh, using an alternative employee size cutoffs to uh, basically address a concern that it could be that other uh, laws around the same time differentially affect male wages for larger firms. Uh, we show that our results go through um, if we instead look at hourly uh, wages. Uh, we uh, check whether actually the uh, lower wages uh, for men are offset by higher bonuses and, and we show that this is not the case. We better control for composition changes uh, in firms by conditioning the sample on employees that stay in the firm, that have been in the firm at least one year before and one a year after the law. And we also show robustness uh, tests, including in our specification, interacted firm and year fixed effects that absorb any <coughs> kind of uh, 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 firm specific changes um, that, that could be driving the results. Just to show you a couple of those, uh, so this is the, the treatment by year uh, effects. As you can see here in the third column, there is no statistically significant uh, difference before the law change. We capture the effects in 2007 and, and 2008. Uh, we do placebos uh, where we, instead of the 35 employee threshold, we consider a 20 or 50 or a 65 cutoff and we cannot uh, replicate our baseline findings. Uh, and we also replicate the analysis by using hourly wages and we get identical results. Now one caveat of, of, of this, this table is that uh, the hourly wage measure we, we have here is, is based on bracketed hours and it is capped while our kind of um, uh, total wage measure we use in our baseline doesn't suffer from that. Uh, we also, um, we're also interested in, in effects along the hierarchy, so our data allows us to uh, basically observe whether an employee is a high level employee, a middle level employee, or a low level employee. Uh, and so when we do this, we see that there is a negative effect across the hierarchy, however, the effect is stronger in, at the intermediate and, and lower level. So it could be um, that here there is, uh, uh, you know, not a lot of comparable it's hard to compare, you know, um, uh, or to find jobs with a lot of women and men um, that are comparable, or it could be that, that changing wages here can, you know, have a lot of negative effects on, on productivity, for example, if you, if, if you um, don't raise uh, male wages. Um, so we also see whether there is an effect on, on promotion or on, on, on female uh, hiring and separation rates. Uh, so to this end, we define uh, an employee to be promoted if she works at a hierarchy level in a given, higher hierarchy level in a given year as compared to the previous year. We will also define a female joining rate as the percent of female employees joining or leaving uh, uh, the firm for living rates in a given year as a percent of total employees joining or leaving. For men is one minus uh, this ratio. Uh, and what we observe for promotions is that actually um, there is a positive effect for women. Women seem to benefit, especially at the low level. They, they are more likely to be promoted to higher levels in the organization. 
Um, women also tend to be hired more. So this is the female joining rate uh, for the three hierarchy level. And we observe economically important results for the intermediate and lower level, which is, suggests that actually the pool of available uh, women or the supply of, of women increases uh, for the type of jobs that are actually now uh, pay more equal wages. When instead we look at uh, uh, living rates, uh, we, we capture no uh, significance. So what I've shown you so far is that actually the law seems to work. Uh, we do observe that gender pay gap is reduced uh, and this by two percentage points. And this is a 10% reduction relative to the pretreatment uh, male wage premium. That was about 20%, as I showed you in the summary stats. And also what uh, we find is that uh, there is some positive spillover effects on other firm decisions that involve women, such as promotion and hiring outcomes. And so then we turn to, you know, uh, to the firm and then ask you know, whether the policy change uh, had an effect on, on, on profitability or, or on firm productivity. So first of all, at the firm level, um, you know, what uh, we find consistent with our earlier results is that the average uh, wage firms paid to their workers uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, lower and it is lower by about 3%. Um, at the same time, we find a negative effect on, on productivity, which is negative and, and significant. It's, it's about 2.5%, the same magnitude as, as the effect on, on wages. Uh, here, we don't observe individual uh, data on productivity, so um, we cannot exactly pin down where this is coming from. It could be that women that learn about the pay gaps get upset and they become less productive, or it could be that uh, just male um, employees don't like the fact that their, uh, their wages um, you know, uh, are not increasing as, as expected, and, and that uh, has a negative effect on, on their productivity. But for firms, in terms of their profitability, the two effects seem to be offsetting each other, and, and we find no statistically uh, significant effects. Um, we then turn to studying some heterogeneity uh, in the effect of, of, of transparency. So we, wa we, we want to see whether you know, managerial preferences kind of matter in terms of how firms uh, respond to the law passage. Uh, given you know minority of managers in our sample are women, and, and we want to measure that captures preferences for the majority of managers in, in our sample, we will kind of use uh, something from the literature that men, that parent daughters, uh, are more likely to adopt pro-women preferences. That there is a large literature that has actually shown that. Uh, so in our context, uh, we will uh, actually show evidence that uh, managers, male managers, uh, with doctor, daughters are actually following fairer pay practices pre-treatment. So on average, they, they are f more fair, fair towards women. But also, we show evidence that they exhibit greater sensitivity to the law passage. And, and they, uh, they are uh, kind of more uh, aggressive in terms of you know, taking measures to, to fix the gender pay gap. We also look at uh, whether the pre-law gender pay inequality matters, and uh, we do show evidence that actually uh, firms uh, that uh, uh, operate in industries where pre-law gender pay inequality is larger um, respond more uh, now that the increased transparency leads to greater accountability and, 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 and uh, the uh, reduction in the gender pay gap is larger in those cases. So let me conclude by saying that um, uh, transparency and gender pay disparities has real effects. So uh, the, the legislation uh, is effective in terms of uh, what you know, it intended to do. Um, uh, the pay gap decreased by two percentage points or a 10% reduction relative to the pretreatment um, mean. Uh, we see what is interesting is, is that the way it happens. It lowers male uh, wages, um, but we find a very weak and not significant effect on female wages. Uh, it has compositional effects also on the organization. It increases hiring for women. Uh, women also tend to be promoted more. Uh, and in contrast to what you know, firms are worried about, uh, we don't find actually that the law impacts their profitability. 
So I, I think that's an important, you know, uh, topic, and, and we be, we should be studying, you know, uh, things, uh, kind of ways to mitigate the, the pen gender pay gap. But some of you may disagree, and you may argue that actually uh, all this is irrelevant because men will naturally gravitate towards higher pay professions like doctor or engineer or CEO, while women will naturally gravitate towards lower paying professions like female doctor or female engineer <laughs> or female CEO. Um, so, Karen, the floor is yours, and you'll have 15 minutes. Thank you. Can you get my... Good. So, um, I'm very happy to discuss this paper. I'm very happy to be here. It's uh, amazing to have such a unique opportunity to network with a lot of female colleagues. So, thanks for inviting me. Um, my job here is to partly give you... Um, set this paper a bit in, in perspective and partly quibble a little bit, of course. Although, generally, I think this um, uh, is a very believable result. So, uh, briefly to summarize this paper, it's about the 2006 law in Denmark that required firms to uh, disclose more statistics around uh, pay according to gender. And the way they uh, attack it... Um, Methodic, method okay, you know what I mean, is to run a diff and diff regression, which means that you take the control sample that was not affected to capture time trends, and then you have a sample that was affected, the firms that had to disclose, and you, you look at the comparison, uh, what's happening between these two samples. And it's really the firms that are treated, the ones that are affected are the ones with more employees, and they are compared to firms, slightly smaller firms. What they find is an average pre-reform pay, pay gap of about 19%, and after this reform, the pay gap drops to about 17%. It's caused by slower growth in male pay, and looking at the firm level, they find that sales and wages drop, but overall it doesn't have any effect on profitability. And finally, they say that the, the, the largest pay gap decline is uh, in occupations with high pay gap pre-reform and uh, uh, for firms with managers with more daughters. So I'm going to start by showing you some statistics from Sweden on the pay gap. And these statistics, it's all from uh, Medlings Institute, that the, the organization that runs the, the pay negotiations and collects statistics. So um, here you can see the pay gap in Sweden, 05, 12, and 17, and the change from 05 to 17, private sector, public sector, all sectors. So you can see in Sweden the pay gap was 84%, or that's not, I the pay gap then is 16%, 84%, that's female pay in percent of male pay, and this is full-time equivalent. So notice that this is not the income of women compared to men, but if they were to work full-time. Uh, and this pay gap has declined by 5 percentage points from 84 to 89 percent um, uh, female pay of male pay in 2017. In the private sector, you can see it was about 89 percent uh, the relative salary and the one that has the worst pay difference is actually the regions that employee hospital staff Lundsting where it went from 71 percent to almost 80 the biggest change but still the largest pay differences um, what then explains this pay gap? Well, the most important factor is actually occupation. So this is the result uh, uh, when they run regressions, they take a uh, log of the pay on the left-hand side, and then they enter different explanatory variables on the right-hand side. First, gender explains about 10% of the pay difference. Then you add age and education. Women are on average slightly older, slightly better educated, so then they should make more, but so when you control for that, you can actually see that the pay gap is about 12%, and then you add occupation and the pay gap um, drops to, to 4%. So this is what they call the unexplained pay gap uh, that reflects maybe skill, maybe effort, we don't know, it's not gender anyway. Um, pay the pay gap is bigger the older the employees are. So this is the, this the yellow one is um, Women, the black one is men, and uh, no, is that correct? Yes. So this is by age. The pay gap can't be difference in male and female pay. Now I'm a bit confused. I actually replaced my other graph. I shouldn't do this. But the gender pay gap is anyway higher by age. So I guess it's the difference between these two. This must be the monthly wages, and you see the pay gap. The difference is bigger uh, the older 
the employees are. It's not so big in the beginning of their careers. Um, and here they've sorted um, all the employees by income, first all men and then all women. And this here is th the year 2000, 2008 and 2016. And this is the pay difference in, in percent. So, um, so one minus the, the relative pay. And you can see that th the, the biggest difference is for the high income people. And that's when they talk about the glass ceiling. It's really in the high end of the distribution. Down here, the, the pay gap is much smaller. It has shrunk overall, but the, the glass ceiling, the big difference at the top, that still remains. So, so that's where we see the biggest differences. Uh, this graph takes a little bit of explanation. So <laughs> uh, each circle is an occupation. There are hundreds of occupational codes, so it's different professions. Red circles are, are occupations that are dominated by females. Blue circles are occupations dominated by men. And the beige ones here are, are relatively equal, so 40 per to 60 percent of each gender. Um, you have the average pay down here, and then you have the female pay in percent of male pay. So what you can see, the size of the circle says how big the occupation is. So you can see the female dominated occupations, there is relatively little pay gap in those. They are mostly around here and they're relatively low paid. Male occupations, the blue ones, they are, are male dominated. That's where you have the bigger pay gaps and that's they're also more prevalent further out. Um, if you can see this graph by blue collar workers, so arbetare, uh, you can see that for the, for the female dominated professions, there's basically no pay gap within the occupation. But again, for the male dominated ones, that's where you see the pay gap. So I was uh, trying to think where, um, where this paper lands. Probably it's about 70% men in these firms, so they would be represented by blue circles. So, so somewhere around here. One thing that I find a bit um, puzzling and that I'll come back to is that the pay gap is so big in your sample compared to what we see in Sweden. And yet, I think in some of the statistics, Denmark seems to have less issues uh, with, with pay gap and, and uh, uh, sorting into different occupations than Sweden have. This is the same graph for white collar workers. The pattern is basically the same. OK, back to the paper. So uh, this diff in diff is designed to control for any trend. And I showed you before that the gender pay gap has declined. So we know that uh, no matter what, uh, it, it is reduced over time. Um, so the idea here then is to, is to identify the years when this disclosure actually affected the wage setting. The reform the law was adopted in June 2006 and it took effect in January 2007. So that means that th the first time that firms were forced to disclose statistics by gender was in 2007. So for me, it's impossible that that should have affected actually the, the wages in 2006. So the first thing is to find out when was this disclosed. And I think that the post reform period should not start earlier in 2007. And actually, if you go back and look at the regressions, they do show year by year that this pay gap in this setting started declining already in 06. That's when the coefficients become uh, significant. But then it can't be the law. Um, and then, of course, the concern is that these two groups of firms, the control firms and the treated firms, they're affected by things which affect them differently. And we all know that the financial crisis came and that, that has made it much more difficult for us when we have samples around this period. And for, for example, um, industry could matter. If the larger firms tend to have a different industry composition, maybe they were differently impacted. And that could affect both a decline in sales and wages compared to the smaller firms. Um, of course, this is uh, incredibly difficult to get around, but maybe you could try to, as a robustness, at least do some industry matches and, and see if the effect is still there if you have firms in the same industry. Another concern is that, uh, the, that large firms are affected differently than small firms. I mean, we see that the pay gap is bigger uh, for when you paid more. We know that larger firms pay more. And we have also seen that the pay gap has shrunk more in larger firms. How can you um, control for that? that? Well, it's very hard. Maybe for robustness, you could have um, a smaller um, a smaller range around the number of employees. Maybe you could do log of sales interacted 
with the post dummy to see that, that that doesn't play in here. Um, in general, we know that larger firms have responded much more. For example, look at publicly traded firms here in Sweden. The largest firms, they now have close to 40% women. The small firms, they still have no women on their board. Um, another thing that I was thinking about is that, so this is about disclosure, but managers, they should know what they pay their employees. I mean, these are not big firms. So managers know this before the reform. And, and if you think that managers with daughters want to be more um, gender aware, or they are, which some, of some other studies have shown, it's not clear to me, again, that they should react more. It seems that they should be more fair prior to the law as well. So, um, so I don't know. Anyway, you could think a little bit more about that, because that wasn't obvious to me. And then, and then my last point is that the pay gap seems relatively large compared to what I see in Sweden. And, and um, I'm just puzzled a little bit about that. So I was thinking, is the sample changing a lot? Is there a lot of firms switching from control to treated firms? You don't talk about how you deal with those. Um, I would like to see also the, the number of employees in each group, the number of firms in each group, the number of firms that switch group, etc to understand the sample more because because there's something that I that doesn't really seem to to match with the numbers that I see just in 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 the overall picture at least from Sweden so um, overall I think it's a very interesting paper that shows uh, the effect of disclosure on the gender pay gap it's well written it's well executed it's really worth uh, reading um, it's difficult to know of course how much of the pay gap that's related to effort and and skills, when you say that wages dropped, sales dropped, is it because uh, women tend to work slightly less, they stay home with sick kids, they do other things? We don't know. It's, uh, it's, um, it's very difficult to say what's unfair and what's fair. Um, the largest pay gap clearly lies in occupation and the fact that women tend to work uh, part-time and not full-time. If you look at the income of Swedish women, it's about 60% of the income of men. And that's not the pay gap. That's primarily contributed to the fact that women don't work a hundred percent to a large extent. Um, and then we also know that female-dominated occupations they have much lower pay. If you remember my graphs with the bubbles, all the red bubbles they were to the left in the graph, which just shows that their average pay is way lower. So, so I think if we want to have more equal pay, this is really a huge uh, problem. Uh, but in general, I think awareness if, uh, is a first step to gender equality, and, and I'm sure that disclosure and, and transparency is an important tool. So thanks for having me read this interesting paper, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. to uh, respond. Great. Um, actually, you raised so many points and I'll forget to address some of them, so maybe if you can put the slides. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, don't I have a lo loud voice? I think I do. Um, so these are great comments, uh, great discussion. Thank you, Karin. Um, a few things. I agree you, with you. There is a long literature that summarizes, you know, there's so many factors that affect the, the pay gap, uh, including, you know, selection into uh, specific occupations and industries and worker age and hours worked and women having children, etc. And I think what is nice about, um, you know, this data and, 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 and the identification strategy is that it allows us to compare uh, similar men and women that do the same occupation in the same firm year before and after the law. Uh, and so the individual firm fixed effect will absorb, you know, a lot of this as well as control for the match between uh, firm and, and, and women. Thank you. I couldn't avoid this in the end. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but, but, but definitely uh, this is the end. And the other issue you raised about women, you know, working less maybe, that's why we do kind of the, the hourly wage to control, you know, for, for that possibility because this is indeed an important concern. Um, now, why we started in 2006 is because, uh, well, uh, firms will respond in anticipation of the law taking effect, um, wages are, uh, are, you know, um, uh, are sticky and in, in, in some sense you have to kind of start early uh, uh, to respond. But when we do the, the by year 
treatment effects. Uh, then we show in the third column that actually the significant difference shows up in 2007 and eight, which is consistent with your prior. Now the crisis uh, is an issue. That's why we stop in 2008 and we don't, uh, you know, kind of uh, look for the longer term effect of this policy, which would have been interesting as well to know. Um, uh, in, in that regard, well, we do uh, show robustness where we interact firm and year fixed effects that will absorb, you know, any time varying uh, uh, shock at the firm level, so hopefully um, that uh, you know uh, addresses some of your concerns. Uh, we have run um, robustness with industry time year fixed effect. Uh, I mean, but again, the firm time year fixed effect is, is kind of a, a better control in that regard. Um, uh, there was this uh, uh, issue about uh, uh, why. Uh, Firms with male managers uh, having daughters will respond after the law. It is true that pre-treatment, these firms pay fairer wages. So on average, uh, yes, th these managers are more firm towards women. But there is something to be said about you know a coordination issue. So uh, I mean, we do do know that it's not easy to change wages because it can have you know effects on productivity. And so it could be that uh, unilaterally they couldn't change you know the equilibrium before. The law they needed kind of uh, you know um, kind of a, a legislation change that would allow firms to coordinate and change the equilibrium and, and we see that these kind of managers are more aggressive uh, always um, also to respond to, to to the law passage but these are great points and and uh, we'll definitely think uh, uh, how to address them better in the next draft thank you so what do you think makes the managers change the wage the social pressure the um, kind of the shame that they would feel. Um, and I mean, um, from my point of view, like, do, like I think it's really hard to argue to a male worker that now they will be paid less just because there is They're shame. Yes, the, the wages that uh -huh. increase as Okay, as okay, okay, so sorry. I agree that, with that, you. That, that, that question is um, taken care of then, thanks. It's not public. Mm -hmm. It's not Within the firm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm wondering, what's the mechanism that makes the managers actually act? Like the social pressure within the firm or something? Yeah. All right, so I have like tons of questions. Um, so first, so I used to work in Sweden, and in Sweden you can actually look up how much money people make, right? Because they have the tax documents. So I wonder, first of all, um, if in Denmark it's the same, right? Because then the, the disclosure rule really has no bite, right? Because you already know. Um, and second, uh, I wasn't quite sure exactly. So the disclosure, is it um, you disclose what everyone makes or just like what all the women make and all the men make regardless of occupation? Um, and so if it's just like a lump sum category, I really wonder um, how one can argue that, that something like that works because I mean, the gender pay gap is about um, women and men being paid differently for the same job. Right, so if you disclose, like this is what all the women make and all the women happen to be, you know, let's say they're all sitting on the board and all the men are secretaries, um, then, you know, uh, how is this gonna, you know, so it doesn't, it's not clear that one can actually argue that this works, right? So I, I guess I wonder how the disclosure is actually formulated and, um, and I didn't see how in your setting you can actually control for equal occupation uh, because that's really key, right? And so, um, yeah. So I have um, a question about the kind of equilibrium effects and how you think about you know the control group. Um, I mean the control firms and treatment firms they are hiring in the same labor market. So whatever dynamic is happening inside of the treatment firms should be relevant. So I, I mean I guess how do you think about potential contamination of of the control group to um, to this reform that was targeted you know um, only at you know the treatment firms. Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Uh, and my other question is, um, so you started off saying there's this big debate, right? And so there's pushback from firms uh, because it's difficult to disclose. Um, so I wonder how you view your, because these, these are very small firms in your sample, right? So disclosing wages for 50 people is not that difficult, right? But if you're a very large firm, it is actually very difficult. Um, and so I wonder how you view your results contributing to the overall debate given that the firms in your sample are so small and whether you can actually look at the bigger firms and see what happened to those firms around the disclosure change and if there's anything interesting going on there. Yeah. So um, 
I'm sort of a little bit worried you're underestimating your results because if your in the firms just below the threshold might um, might still want to disclose if the employee representative asks for it because it's sort of weird. I mean, you're close to the threshold, so you know if I ask for it, you, so. Um, they might have been disclosing. I'd like to know to what extent that happened, that, that your control group is treated as well. Uh, a small note on your T values. You might want to use normalized T values instead um, in this setting. And on, on Renee's comment, I agree. Uh, you know, if you're just disclosing the average pay differences, um, you know, sort of how much information does that give if all the men are, are board members and all the, all the females are executives. However, that gives you very interesting variation you can exploit. So you can imagine settings comparing firms where the, where the sort of occupational structures across men and women are very similar uh, to, to, to settings where, where there are large differences. So the informational content, this might be different and that's why it might be interesting to look at. Okay, um, so a, a lot of sorry, please in the mic. Uh, yeah, let, let's see. Um, uh, let's see, and then we can discuss also over uh, coffee. In terms of the the mechanism, um, I, I think that there is you know a lot of stories that that uh, uh, might uh, be going on here. The first one it could be a coordination thing. Um, so you know the law allows firms to coordinate and change the equilibrium. It could be that the law um, affects the way. Um, different genders can negotiate. So there is a literature that documents that men are actually better negotiators. And the fact that now, you know, the managers can tell them, look, you know, we cannot do this because we have to report and disclose, uh, right, the statistics may actually, you know, um, uh, limit their bargaining power. Um, I wish we could, uh, uh, you know, or it could be other agency stories that uh, male managers favor, you know, male employees and now actually that they have to report you know, these, these agency problems are mitigated. Um, I don't think that uh, we, you know, can cleanly disentangle between these two mechanisms, but it could be, you know, um, uh, a lot of, of these things going on. Um, now, I think that it was my fault that I didn't spend too much time on uh, clarifying what uh, the disclosure is. And you're right uh, that, you know, uh, rules, for example, like in the UK, where you have to report the average or the median are actually maybe not the right way to do this. So in Denmark, it was disclosing uh, gender, disaggregated uh, uh, weight statistics by gender for uh, employees doing similar occupations. Um, and, and, and so it was not uh, individual wages uh, because anonymity had to be preserved, but it had to be, you know, um, uh, kind of the average uh, men and, and women um, kind of pay uh, for similar type of, uh, of jobs. But, but that, that was not a, that that was not. Um, then uh, you had this other question about uh, bigger firms. I think that uh, it is an interesting question how you know we can generalize the result exactly when we look you know the whole economy. I think that empirically it is very hard to find the right control group. Um, you know, uh, when we look at that kind of uh, bigger firms and a way to identify this. Um, you know, do we see um, firms below the threshold disclosing? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if this is happening. According to interviews uh, uh, with the DA, you know, they all firms that disclosed employ more than 35 uh, um, workers. And I agree with you that would kind of underestimate uh, uh, the magnitudes. Um, now, Marianne's point, you know, uh, they all hire from the, the, the labor market, and I guess uh, your question was, you know, are control firms not responding as, as well? Or whatever, you know, they are forcing the allowing kind of men's wages at the firms, they can go and put up in control firms. Oh, so, so do we see yeah, firms think, moving? Yeah, you think about how the labor market is right. affecting the firms that they control group. If, right. You know, so this is an interesting, uh, yeah, we should look at whether, you know, they move uh, from kind of larger yeah. to smaller firms. On average, when we look at uh, kind of uh, departure rates, we don't capture any significance, but uh, maybe if we do it at the individual level, it will be something interesting. That's a great suggestion. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed something, but uh, we can discuss more <laughs> over coffee. Thank you.